Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce a panel featuring three members of the MFA Fine Arts Class of 2020 who are participating in Dread Dream exhibition that is up right now at the SVA Chelsea Gallery. As many of you know, the students in the Star Cross class of 2020 um, started the program before the COVID-19 pandemic. And then in March of their second year, from you know, sort of one week to the next, everything shut down. And New York went into lockdown and SVA made a makeshift and very rapid transition to online learning and Zoom. And I have to say, the three of you and the others in, in your class adapted so splendidly and were so um, so supportive of us. I mean, and of one another. Um, one of the one of the highlights, I think, of the of a otherwise very dark experience was the way students and faculty and staff managed to pull together to um, continue this process and to help you complete your your degrees and your your educations. Initially, we we had a space set up for their thesis show, and um, we were thinking we might be able to figure out a way to to still have an in-person physical thesis exhibition, possibly letting in one person at a time, or, you know, it was a space, it was a storefront with big windows. So we thought maybe we'll just hang the show and let people look at it through the windows from outside. But at the end, it just seemed too compromised. So we had an online exhibition uh, and a student, a couple of students, um, particularly Elise Warfield um, and Danielle Almeida organized an incredible additional exhibition called so the thesis show is please don't come to the show. And the other one that Elise did was called Other Way Around. Other way around. Okay. Please don't come to the show with Elise and Dan. Yeah, so they had two exhibitions actually. Kind of amazing. Um, we also did online open studios. In any case, we at the time I promised them that if there was any way for us to do an in-person physical thesis exhibition or exhibition of their work. Um, that we would do that. And then things worked out, got an email from um, the head of SVA galleries early in the year, uh, offering us this slot in the Chelsea Gallery. And we jumped at it because it was finally our opportunity to um, give them the in-person exhibition that we had you know, promised. And fortunately, Regine Basha, who had curated what was originally going to curate their in-person thesis show and they curated the online show, was able to come back. She now lives in Spain and organize what I think is a terrific exhibition. Not all of the students in the who graduated that year were able to participate, but we have, I think it's 22 um, artists in the show. And I know most of you were able to go to the opening last week, and I think it looks fantastic. And so we thought for this week's talk, we would put together, you know, a little panel to talk about, um, well, whatever comes up, uh, your work and what you've been up to since you graduated and um, whatever questions our students might have. So I'm gonna read their bios now, and then I might also riff and improvise just a little bit. Um, beginning with Carlos Rosales Silva, Carlos was born on the border of the United States and Mexico in the city of El Paso, Texas. His studio practice considers the vernacular culture of the American Southwest, the Western canon of our history, and the political and cultural connections and disparities between them. Carlos has exhibited throughout Texas and in Mexico City, in New York City, Los Angeles, Miami, Minneapolis, Chicago, Kansas City, and elsewhere. He's also been an artist in residence at Abrams Art Center here in New York, just a couple years ago. Uh, Residency Unlimited here in New York, that was in 2020, at Art Pace in San Antonio, Texas in 2018, so before coming to this program, and at Pioneer Works in Brooklyn in 2017. 
Recent exhibitions include group shows at the Latinx Project at New York University, uh, Texas Tech University, Beverly's in New York, and Left Field Gallery in Los Osos, California. A forthcoming solo exhibition of new works will be shown at Sargent's Daughters at their new location in Los Angeles, California. Yay! Carlos graduated from this program with an MFA in Fine Arts and currently, and still, we're so glad you're still here, lives and works in New York City. Come on in. To Carlos's right, nearest me is Jay Elizondo, an artist whose work seduces viewers into visceral confrontations with the trans body. She was born in Columbus, Ohio in 1996, received an MFA from this place in 2020 and a BFA from Columbus College of Art and Design in 2018. So straight out of, out of one art school into another and then into the hot house of Maryland <laughs> studio um, where she's been working. I don't know if you mentioned that, but for a minute now, right? <laughs> Okay, cool. Jay's work has been featured in exhibitions in New York, including Idol Worship at Smack Mellon, um, Artist in Focus at Baxter Street, uh, The Unspeakable, A Dark Show, and Horror House at the Spicer Building, Crashing the Party at Plaxall Gallery on Island City, right? Mm -hmm. um, right near where my own studio is. Uh, Criminalize This at Amos Eno Gallery and in Miami for um, 2018 and 2019 uh, Satellite Art Fairs and in Columbus for her solo exhibition Premature at Byers Gallery. Her curatorial projects include Unfixed at Somad in New York. You remember how lonely everything was in the beginning at Please Don't Come to This Show, which you just heard about. It's online. And talented, brilliant, incredible, amazing, show-stopping, spectacular, never the same, totally unique, completely not ever been done before, unafraid to reference or not reference, put it in a blender, shit on it, vomit on it, eat it, give birth to it at SEA Chelsea Gallery in New York. Wins the award for best title ever. And hardest to read when you're introducing someone. <laughs> I thought I might even get some Bigger way for that. Um, she was a resident artist at Chautauqua, the Chautauqua School of Art Residency up in Chautauqua, New York in the summer of 2020 at the New York Studio Residency Program in Brooklyn in 2016. Elizondo is currently featuring um, a featured artist for Smack Mowen's 22-23 Hot Picks following her feature the year before. She's a recipient of the 2020 Edward Zutra Memorial Award, the Je uh, Jeff F. Hilson Memorial Fund, the Edith Smilak Fund, and the nominee of the 2018 Association of Independent Colleges and Universities of Ohio Award for Excellence in the Visual Arts. Her work has been published in the Brooklyn Rail, Art Forum, Daily Lazy, Sidewalk Killia, Sidewalk Killa, Front Runner Magazine, Nobody's Fashion Week Zine Issue One, That Way Zine Issue One, and Hits Mag Issue Three. She lives and works here in New York City. Yay! Love well, you, stick around. Finally, Maria Dusan, born in 1993, is a Colombian interdisciplinary artist living and working in Brooklyn. Her paintings and sculptures examine the loss of innocence, memory, and the body following transgressed intimacy. Dusan has an MFA in Fine Arts from School of Visual Arts, this program, and a BFA with distinction and honors in communication design at the Pratt Institute. She's exhibited in New York and um, at the Project for Empty Space, uh, Wiste Project, Winston Wechter Fine Art, La Mama Galleria, Art Lot, uh, and O'Flaherty's, and presented a solo show at 24 East Broadway. She is shown virtually in Dear Artists, Tutu Gallery, SVA Galleries, and the Flat File Gallery. Dusant's work and writing have been published in Art Zealous, 24 East Broadway, and Dear Artists. So 
So here's how we're going to do this. Each artist has been asked to give a like short, like five minute um, presentation on their work. And then we'll gather again for some Q&A and conversation. Let's begin with Jay. It's good to be up here again. Hi, um, I'm Jay Elizondo. Um, thank you for that really long bio. I should have shortened that. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I don't know how many of you got to see the work at Dread Dream, um, so I won't talk about it for too long. Um, so in 2020, for uh, my like, final work here in this program, I did a, a series of me performing as my mother. And this is like an example of one of the images that was taken during that performance. Um, all of the photog photographs were taken by a photographer named Kate Sweeney. Um, and I essentially performed as my mother by taking on her kind of clothing, her hairstyle, um, and I even traveled back home to Columbus, Ohio to perform in her home. Um, and also you'll see these kind of queered objects around her landscape that is kind of, um, will make an appearance again when I talk a little bit about the sculptural installation kind of component of this work. Um, so one of the pieces that's at the show right now that was part of the series is um, a video. I have a little excerpt here. Hopefully the sound isn't carbo. So that brings me to the very feminine soft boy, not being able to control his feelings. Believe me, I panicked, not because my son may be gay. I knew that from the time he was three, but the life he was going to live, the hatred, the bullying, the misunderstanding of society. But I kept quiet and tried to show my love and support, hoping he would find his way and one day be happy within himself. The bullying did get bad. The many tears and anger I tried to wipe away from my son's eyes, those big, brown, almost black, gay eyes. I knew it, he knew it, everyone knew it, but we all still played the game. He's going to be gay. Cute, yeah. So um, part of the series was this video component where my mother um, recited passages from her diary and I recorded that and kind of made a script out of, like, I don't know, two hours worth of content um, into this six minute 35, um, and it was filmed by Darren Ferry, just to make sure that he gets name dropped. Um, and both the photographer and the, the uh, filmmaker who did this work with me are uh, queer artists in Columbus, Ohio. That was kind of important to me to work with them. Um, and yeah, you can see in the video, my mother's kind of reminiscing on her experiences raising me and it was, it's interesting reflecting on this work now, two years later, because I transitioned and I hadn't transitioned when I made this work. And it's funny to see it now because it was kind of like me closing a chapter um, before coming out to my mother. Um, and it's weird uh, now watching it and all the he's and the dead names, but you know, I'm glad I made this work. It was necessary. Um, it was also the first time in a very long time that I like shaved and like kind of passed as a cis woman. So that it was very transy at the time when I didn't know that's what I was making when I made it. And then this is the installation component of the series. Um, it's a vanity that I covered in glitter and put the cleared objects onto. The objects are all objects um, that represent my mother from my life growing up. Um, she cleans houses for a living. So there's a can of lemon pledge that's been Bedazzled. Um, and there's a little precious moments figurine that was the baby boy sitting that I put a little bow on to make it look like the baby girl sitting. They're literally the same, just the girl has a bow. Um, so yeah, so these objects kind of became a big part of the making and kind of 
personifying my mother's identity through the objects that she uses, which is kind of how I always express my femininity. As like a repressed trans woman, I was very into pop culture and objecthood kind of basically being how I expressed myself. Um, and so yeah, that's the work that's in the show. Uh, one of the works that I did for that series was a portrait of my father crying. Uh, my dad drew himself crying when I was younger to give to my mom for like breaking his heart, which is iconic. Uh, and I remember this drawing, but she doesn't like know where it is. So I drew it from memory when I was making this series. And he was 26 when he did the drawing, had his heart broken. So I am 26 and started a drawing of me crying. Um, and it just feels very fitting to kind of have this uh, pairing now. Um, so it's still a work in progress and not finished with the drawing of me yet, but eventually like I'll present this work side by side. Um, and yeah, it was very challenging, I guess, <laughs> a simple word for uh, coming out as a trans woman to my father. Um, uh, growing up in like a Catholic family, um, you know, machismo. So it was uh, not the easiest thing to do, but he's coming around. He's gotten better with the pronouns, gotten better with the naming. Um, when I went there for Christmas, he even corrected my abuelita, so that was nice. So, you know, we're moving along. Um, and then I wanted to throw in like two things that were kind of more of what I'll talk about when we do the panel, but um, since transitioning and kind of coming out of school, um, I've been doing a lot of work with my friends and a lot of collaboration work. Um, transitioning itself is something that requires a lot of like internal practice and just the idea of like being in a studio space by myself making objects uh, just didn't seem like something I wanted to do in the meantime. Um, kind of always focusing on me, it's, it can be kind of taxing. So like a way to um, be in my community and uh, kind of have support um, was through collaboration. So this is a, a, also an alumni from this program. Um, I think some of you might have even met her. She was working here for a moment. Um, Michelle Girodello, she's my best friend. Um, and we're doing a collaboration right now, kind of like a performance miniature hybrid. Um, and this is kind of a little sneak peek of that, but um, that's like one way that I've been having a studio practice that isn't, I guess, as isolation focused as my studio practice was in this program. And then also curating. Uh, curating is something that I really like to do. It's um, another way to have that kind of community. Um, and it's also a way to be in the art world in a way that I want to be in the art world. Um, I'll talk a little bit more later about my job and that version of the art world. Um, so this was a group show that I did with um, another alumni, um, Lorenzo Trevergo. Um, Lorenzo is a really great artist, also trans um, photographer, and our paths have been crossing a lot uh, before we did this show. And he basically was like, hey, there's this opening at SOMAD. Um, SOMAD's a gallery on uh, 23rd Street. It's um, all then the queer run. And uh, yeah, they, they chose us and out of 500 artists, we narrowed it down to 12 and the show was really amazing. And it was nice to work with somebody who I admire, who is in the same community as me, but also um, to, I don't know, have conversations with other artists talking about things that I'm talking about in vastly different ways. Um, again, part of that is kind of collaboration, getting out of my own bubble. Um, and the show is, uh, it was really beautiful. And 
it was a really nice experience. It was in like a very DIY space. So we got to do whatever we wanted in it. And the art was all over the place, which is what I love about group shows. And we had artists who have been like making art for 20 years. And we had artists like straight out of grad school. And it was nice to kind of just merge all of these different artworks and identities together. And we even had like a performance night, which was really fun. And we did like a little panel moment. And we had a interview with the Brooklyn Rail, which was really nice. So um, my favorite way of being in the art world is like doing things with my friends and doing things with other artists that I admire. Um, anything that's happened in my art career since moving to New York that is of any kind of highlight for me is usually my friends are involved or, or an artist that I've looked up to um, that I got to work with. Um, and Lorenzo is one of those people. So yeah, that's, you know, quick and dirty. If you have any questions about the work, um, this is kind of how you can contact me and I can go into further detail about certain things I mentioned earlier when we're like having a more cash conversation. So yeah, thank you. Our next panelist this evening is Maria Dusson. Hi everyone. Does that sound all right? Yeah? yeah. Okay, great. Well, I am Maria Usa, and as Mark mentioned before, I'm from Bogota, Colombia, but I've been in the States for about uh, 13 years, and the last nine of those in New York. Um, my undergrad was in illustration. And after that, I came here to SBA, and this is where I officially started a pursuit of uh, fine arts career for which I am very grateful. It's just very nice to do that. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, so my work explores the the loss and reclaiming of innocence and intimacy, which usually results in wall sculptures and the occasional painting. Um, Uh, usually the process for those sculptures is I'll create an original model with clay. From that, I'll make a mold. And then I create several copies with different treatments or materials um, and sort of imbue in each piece a different history or perhaps a personality. Um, for the most part, uh, in order to delve into these ideas, so loss and innocence and intimacy and reclaiming all that. I use visual metaphors or visual analogies. And there's some certain motifs that I keep returning to that include the figure of the dog or canines, loops, bedding clothes, or basically any textile that interacts with the body, um, swirling or going phenomena natural phenomena like water, vegetation, uh, hair, uh, that's a hair one, right? And lastly, um, this avatar of innocence, which I created here in the VA, which was actually my, my first piece in this program. It was really exciting. It's the first time that I, I gave sculpture a serious try. So the original figure is the gray figure here, Viva. Is what I call her because that's the yeah, figuring it out as I go. <laughs> and then I made mold of her and created several. But um, this was a very pivotal piece for me because from this one ex exploration, um, it bifurcated into many other different themes, I believe, that tie into either her narrative or pushing beyond what she means in our world and perhaps pushing that identity into adulthood. I'll just share really quickly. Um, she's holding a little butter knife to connote the ineffectiveness, yet the instinct that a young person may feel when they're unsafe and the, this desire to protect themselves that is always sort of intuitive. Um, 
And so from here, I just wanted to show some pictures of when I started to notice how I rendered her, made me think of other things. Um, for instance, you can see how um, folds in clothing or gestures can be quickly abstracted into something that's volatile in their strokes. Um, so this led into an exploration of what textile and clothing and beddings can, can connote a moment of intimacy and operated trust. Um, once again, they, they all take very abstracted interpretations of what that could be, but what I hope is that there's a, a subtle hint of the body in them as well. Um, later on, I created like these monumental heads uh, for my thesis here of her. Um, and with this project, I, I sort of started to explore then what is the internal uh, feelings and landscape of my viva, or what, what is she going through? So at one, it can seem like these heads are serenely floating peacefully, but perhaps they're dejected and sinking. Um, both processes that may arise from, from trauma, especially childhood physical trauma. And then... Sorry, I don't need to stop. Yeah. Those heads over the side of the medium? Um, so the, I have a variety. So the gray one is the original gray. Uh, K. Gray K. Um, this white one on the right is um, plaster and hydrocal. The beige one in the back is uh, aqua resin. And then this green one you can kind of see in the corner, that's approximately. So these are different types of resins, um, which we can, we can talk about. Uh, Experimenting with materials is something that I love doing in my work as well. And these heads are roughly 24 by 24 inches, something like that. Uh, oh no, 18 by 18 by <laughs> 20 shots. <laughs> um, so when I was done with this uh, gray piece, I started looking at her hair because I like to repurpose the same clay for most of my projects. So when I was looking and sort of disassembling her, I started to notice her and it led to a different kind of exploration. Um, and it's echoes to bodies of water or vegetation made me start to want to contextualize in, in an environment. Um, this is another instance where I want to look at the societal constraints or context that may bring about a person, how they may even be transgressed upon even before arriving to this world, what does it mean to have intergenerational constraints, social preconceptions. Um, yeah. and, and this is another instance of inspiration of vegetation and landscape and how these volatile and dynamic flows can, can echo an internal life and feeling. Um, this piece is at the show in um, Chelsea Galleries. Um, and with this piece, um, I've started also to begin to borrow from allegorical narratives or fictional uh, stories. In a, yeah, in a lady. So this is my interpretation of Ophelia. I'm sure you guys have seen different uh, interpretations of these beautiful paintings. Um, not, maybe I'll do a little recap, but Ophelia is from Shakespeare's novel, a uh, play, uh, Hamlet, where she loses her mind after having some intimate encounters with Hamlet, and eventually that leads her to drown in a body of water. So here I wanted to be expressive of her hair in the water as she's sinking, perhaps toilet, grasping to reemerge. Um, now this is a very literal, uh, what I think visually a very literal interpretation of a path of life. So I really enjoy this figure of the loops, you know, it does something going on these ups and downs, sort of trying to grow and better and handle 
our paths. Things like that. Um, yeah. And now um, I began to think of who could be the aggressor in the narrative. Because we're not simply harmed by our own, so, although they certainly play a huge role in that, but in many instances, there may be an aggressor, a predator that can be shielded as a friend or a foe. And we don't really, aren't really, really aware of that it's actually happening. So I find that the figure of the dog, the canine, has a lot of room to interpret our relationships to other humans, whether we intend them to be good or bad. And here's another uh, inspiration of the figure of the dog. These are, I hope you can see them, but in the, in the, for instance, in this cement um, plate, I carved in drawings of the dogs. Uh, this piece is also at the show. And um, maybe if you happen to go and take a closer look, maybe you'll begin to notice the details. A close up. And right now, I think I'm venturing into exploring what voids mean um, to digest uh, these themes. So, and I don't know if you can see, but there's also more images of the dog, whether they may seem like they're playing or fighting, everyone one and the same, across a body, perhaps. Um, all right, thank you very much. Hey, everyone, can you hear me? Good. Yeah, great. Um, so I think it was actually in this very program that I was confronted with a professor who was arguing with me that maybe I wasn't making paintings. Uh, maybe I was making sculptures or installations or any number of things that were not what I was defining my own work as. Um, curiously, this person couldn't really decide what I was making um, or how to define it, which I really liked. I think having grown up as you know, a child of immigrants on the border of the United States and Mexico alongside a uh, indigenous people's reservation uh, I was used to crossing lines. Um, and I was overly familiar with the brutal logic of borders and categorization. Um, I think abstraction itself is a space where the kind of binaries that are created by a border logic can be shattered. Uh, these concepts of being and non-being, they don't really exist for me when I'm making my work. And so I find that really comforting. Uh, there's a kind of freedom for me in not knowing like where the background is, where the foreground is, and in creating a like kind of confusing pictorial space. Maybe one where you can almost understand that there's a landscape or a piece of architecture, but you can't quite put your finger on it. Um, you know, luckily for me, I was uh, raised by like intensely creative people, people who were poets, builders, craftspeople, um, musicians. And I grew up around a lot of really beautiful tactile examples of things that were made by hand with care. And um, I really like to bring that with me everywhere. And it's a really amazing foundation to have for my work. Um, I was also taught to revere the land around me. And I grew up in buildings that were like made out of earth and brick that were covered in sand and cement. And I have to be honest with you, like I didn't really realize this until I left and started my higher education. Um, I think there I also kind of ran into these boundaries of like what was documented as cult or what were documented as cultural achievements, uh, which were defined by these like European ideals that are just like, you know, have completely like taken over kind of Western higher education. And so I think it was then that I realized, well, wow, I'm like really lucky I have this counter argument kind of built into me. Um, I think the building blocks for these works are an obsession with color and texture, obviously. I think that um, for me, I'm following uh, the study of color as defined by, you know, the modernist Joseph Albers and others. And Albers talks about color as a system of interdependence. And so this means that the way we perceive a color is fully dependent on the other color surrounding it. Uh, this is a really beautiful 
and moving idea to me like you can't see anything without the influence of everything else around it and to me uh like no matter how hard you try so for me this is another kind of like uh instance of like anti-border logic that i'm really um, obsessed with and so albers by the way like was obsessed with mexico uh, there's this really beautiful show at the Guggenheim called Joseph Albers in Mexico, and he was like took like 30 or 40 trips, him and Ani Albers, who's an amazing artist as well, um, were in Mexico like several times over their lifetime after they immigrated to the United States. Um, and so I like finding these kind of feedback loops um, where like, you know, what we kind of perceive as like modernism is like touching something that I'm like overly familiar with. And so part of my Practice is also researching um, and traveling to places where I can witness these sorts of interactions. And so here on the left or on the right is an indigenous dwelling um, that is 20 miles down the road from a like postmodern eco community called Arcosanti. And this is in Arizona. Um, both of these things are like kind of trying to do similar things. One is like built into the divot of a like huge canyon, you know, this is like made to house like hundreds of people, this uh, indigenous dwelling, and it has like stood the test of time because it's under this shelf. Uh, Marco Santi, which is also like this amazing community that is trying to uh, be off the grid, live off the land, is unfortunately built on top of a mesa. So it's kind of always like in disrepair because it's prone to the elements. Um, but it's just like amazing to me that these are just down the street from each other. Um, more recently, or rather, um, I guess like having a research practice is important because it kind of makes me obsessive with my work. Like everything, every time I travel, I'm like trying to see something that is relevant to me for the work. Um, everything I read is kind of feeding into the practice. And I think like focusing on um, a little bit more holistically on my practice has really like strengthened my work in a lot of ways. And so, you know, it kind of, is mysterious what we end up doing in the studio. It's kind of like instinctual. And so to be able to kind of focus my, my energy on what I'm looking at has been really important. Um, more recently, I've been traveling a lot to Mexico City where there is a more like relevant history of art and architecture, which also comes with its own, you know, contradictions, intricacies, and other things to learn. Uh, on the right is the home of Max Chetto, who is a uh, German architect who fled Nazi Germany in 1938 and combined the building materials and traditions of Mexico City with the functionalism and um, industrial you know, processes of modernism. On the other side is Anahuacali, which is a neo-indigenous structure designed by Diego Rivera and the artist, uh, the other artist, Juan O'Gorman, and it houses Diego Rivera's like intense and vast collection of uh, pre-Columbian artifacts. And they're all organized, not like institutionally, which would be by epic, by people. They're organized just like with vibes, like dancers next to dancers, uh, you know, bulls next to bulls, like, you know, uh, fertility gods or fertility statues next to fertility statues, quite amazing. And it's so like such an artist museum and it's like this really, really beautiful, place to go in Mexico City if you're ever there. Um, so technically this work has taken about 10 years to get to where it is. I'm mixing my own paints with pigment dispersion and acrylic polymer with glass bead, crushed stone. I'm like um, dyeing stones with pigment dispersion. I laser cut acrylic and cut panels with CNC routers, both of which I learned at various jobs. Um, being working in a sign shop or working in a furniture shop. Um, you know, it's like a lot of patience and a lot of like flopping basically to make abstract work like these um, in multiples. I think similar to Jay, I'm really, really lucky to be able to um, have a like, what I like to call like a resource sharing practice that's masquerading as a curatorial practice. I think that like, as you know, an artist, it's so much funner when you can bring your friends along or meet, use like art as an excuse to make new friends or enter into conversations with new artists. And so a curatorial practice is a really wonderful way to do that. Um, it's a show at spring break and then at my gallery that represents me here in New York and in Texas, Ruiz Healy Art. So a couple of shows that I've curated and that's it. Thank you.
thanks for coming and thanks for being generous with your time and for participating in the show too. Um, I just ran into uh, mm -hmm. Stefan on the way down here on the elevator, and we were remarking on how um, the show really looks great. It doesn't look like a thesis show. I mean, nothing against thesis shows, but it yeah. looks more like a say. How do you put it? You didn't say like a real show, but we're not there. Well, no, you, you are there. That's the point. But also, maybe because the show wasn't overcome, as these shows sometimes are. Maybe because I mean, some of the work was presented, some of the work in the show may have been presented as part of the thesis project, but a lot of it was made either shortly after the thesis in later on in 2020 or in 2021 or 2022, like more recent. Um, But I guess before you even talking about that, I, I do have some specific questions for each of you, um, sort of keying off the presentations. And um, maybe I'll start with you, Carlos, just because you presented last. Um, so you talked about transgressing border logic. Yeah. Um, and you talked about that in terms of um, learning the boundaries between painting and sculptures, but in what other ways, or at least there was that one faculty member who came into your studio was sort of probing that. In what other ways do you think your work transgresses border logic or other kinds of borders? Yeah, I think that um, for me, it's also about the actual image itself, which is um, basically collapsing recognizable structures that um, are also like, vibrating because of their color, they're also like um, disorienting because of you know, where they sit in space, where you know one sit, shape sits in relation to another and all like, the color interacts to then push things forward or backwards. Um, it's all very like formal. It's not like um, there's a representation of any concrete thing, but that's kind of what's exciting to me. It's that being that kind of disoriented, not being sure about something. I think there's like, you know, this funny idea where it's like the more I learn the less I know, which is great. Like, it's beautiful. It's nice to be kind of like stupid about something and not be uncertain, not be like confident about something. So sometimes people talk about the language of abstraction or the language of painting. I think that's a pretty loose use of the term language. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's I mean, abstraction can't can communicate. And language communicates, but language always depends on these structures, you know, phonetic, grammatical structures, uh, and the sort of logic of difference. Abstraction is a lot more musical and poetic, I think. Yeah, I'm sure. and linguistic. But what I, I hear you talking about your work in terms that are both conceptual and political, that there's a, a politics of abstraction. In, but there's a there's a politics within the abstraction in your work, and then politics that express that's expressed through transaction. I'll make my question specific. Um, does that depend, however, on language that's external to the work, or is it is the politics in the abstraction internal to the work? Do you know what I mean? Is it intrinsic or extrinsic for both? I think the works can't exist without me, who is a you know I have a politic. Okay, I am like a person that is, uh, you know, that has my politics. Like the work doesn't exist without me. Right? So, in that sense, I guess it is intrinsic, but I don't think it's like necessary to be able to read the work. I think that it is still abstraction. So, you know, I would hope that the work itself is just like able to be viewed and on its own terms. Mm -hmm. And there are like transgressive things in the work that are computational, like the, the color. The, like use of texture, um, you know, they're like sometimes scaled, like they seem quite large, but sometimes they're quite small. It's just like there's a confusion that's not what's happening in them too. That is a little bit computational that I like, but um, yeah, it's not wishy washy enough for you. It, well, it's, it's great because I love that what you did say, because I was asking if, it, if it's dependent on language that you use to frame your work, like titles or artist statements or the blurbs that you may have had a role in writing that have appeared in press releases and exhibitions, things oh. like that, right? And what you first said is you can't separate me from the work. 
done. So it's not so much dependent on the language that's spun around it, it's woven around it, but it's more um, you as a person uh, with an identity of the body, I suppose. Yeah. So your work then meets many different audiences in different kinds of places. I Absolutely. imagine that the people who you were connecting with when you were at Artbase in San Antonio were pretty different from the people who were seeing your work in, was it like a cafeteria at Memorial Sloan Perry? Absolutely, and I mean, that's like a function of it as well. Like that, like, I wasn't even thinking of, you know, that Memorial Sloan Perry um, installation was, you know, commission, which I was excited about, but it was also like a deadline. And I wasn't actually thinking about what that, how that work would function. Ultimately, you know, I was like, had such a tight turnaround on it. When it got in there, like, it was so, I was so really moved and people were like, moved by it. Mm -hmm. It's so fascinating. And it's like, there's no real, like, there's a title, there's title kind of in the corner, but it's just there while we're building it. It's not okay. I'm just thinking about how when our work reaches different communities or audiences, different people, and each place in each community, people bring with it different kinds of uh, visual literacies or just experience. So, you know, a professor, an instructor here is going to be able to read your work in certain ways that are really different from somebody who may have more foresight experience with some of the vernaculars maybe that you're engaging <laughs> with. Um, and then you get a place like Slow Pettery where it's just sort of like the families of people who are getting cancer there and they're and you know people who work in the hospital. Absolutely, yeah. And it's actually I think when you made their mom is that something like that. Yeah, yeah. Your mom walked into the studio and I had it was like one open studio. She walked into the studio and she was like, well, it is when you got it. <laughs> oh shit! Wow, that's that's so she had she had the chops to read that work. Yeah, that's cool. Oh. That's the same time I think your abstract abstraction in its own is very avails itself to anyone because of its abstraction. But that's funny. Did I mortify? No, no, no. I don't think they are. We use the microphone. I'm sorry, we cannot use the microphone because it's tethered there. All right, we'll try yeah. to we'll project. Yeah, okay. I was thinking the, the, that I and three of them have big voices. We'll just try to remember to use them. We'll talk to the back row. Okay. All right. We use our outdoor voices. Great. Um, one last question for you, and then I'll go to okay. others. What's that? Outdoor. Outdoor voices. How did you get the Memorial Sloan Kettering gig? Carlos? How did I get the Memorial How did that Sloan come Kettering? into the last? So um, I was walking down the street and a man stopped me and said, Forget about it. Really? Wow. I'm a really huge fan. If I'm not like fucking out. Someone said, I'm a huge fan of your work. And I was shocked um, and pleased because I was with uh, my partner who was absolutely just like livid that this was happening. Um, on the street because she knew it would inflate my ego so huge but um so this person saw me and i was like oh thank you so much and later on they messaged me and it turns out they had started a small space downtown called my pet ram which is just a gallery kind of i think on orchard street and um yeah you just messaged me on instagram said they've been following my work for a long time would i like do a studio visit would I like, you know, consider showing in my like, you know, artist run gallery basically? And something that I've always kind of um, done for the entire time in making work is that I'll take almost any studio visit unless it's extremely inconvenient um, because of exactly things like this. So I did a visit, we did like a small group show. And then a few months later, he contacted me and said he was um, putting together a proposal for Memorial Sloan Kettering cafeteria. And could he propose my work? And so it started like this six month process of having to send, you know, images and proposals and, um, you know, kind of going back and forth basically about what it was going to be, if it was going to be, how much money it was going to be, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, that's how it happened. 
really just like a bully ball, literally on the street, which is like shocking. So that it was also kind of like, you know, take that studio visit. You don't know what's gonna happen, basically. What neighborhood were you in? Where was I in? Oh my god, I was walking on York Avenue. Okay, so keep in mind, walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, by, um, by the hospital, actually. By the, no, that's cool. So, Maria, Maria, um, I feel like your work changed quite a bit while you were here, although the change was perhaps deceptive in a way, because you also work quite slowly in a way, like. You know, somebody might come in and see, oh, she's still making those little dreams, um, those little divas. Um, but I, I feel like that's partly because in your work, there's this process of, it's like you're imbuing all of this meaning and story and, you know, like generational stuff, trauma into these objects, almost like casting a spell or something. So that, I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking about how that way of working and how that maybe helped you negotiate all the, you know, the vulnerability that comes along with making work about stuff that is so deeply personal. Right, yeah, well, like I, I mentioned before, I think abstraction, <laughs> But I don't know if I can do that. Abstraction. Um, I guess I, I should I go back. Um, I think it's very helpful for me to channel an emotion and an intention as I'm working. I think that's just a very intuitive thing to do for all of us as artists. And I happen to make work about things that I care a lot about, that are within me, that are very visceral and emotional. And so an abstract gesture can tap into, into those things that so often can be ineffable, right? Like we don't have the exact language for them because they're so fast in their magnitude. These are usually things that we carry silently. Uh, so, so yeah, and I don't mean to say that whenever I'm in the studio, I'm like doing it, they going through it, they think, but, but um, I do keep it in the back of my head. Uh, and because I go, I work with molds, casting, and other casting, it's very labor. So I think once I get into the mold of things there, I can sort of let go of that feeling and just go through the more mechanical motions of casting and things like that. Some of the word you just use the word abstract or abstraction again, but some of the work that you made while you're here that you showed us earlier is not what I think of a, a of a think of as abstract uh, a figure of a girl or a head. I think of those as being um, what they used to call objective, but or now people call like representational or naturalistic or something like that. Or, uh, that you know, not pure, not objective abstraction. So, what in this case, what do you mean abstraction as in a kind of like translation from one thing to another? Or no, no, no. I suppose I was referring mostly to that body of work, this just... word gestural. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have done a couple of pieces like that during my stay here, mm -hmm. and then I have a different practice that is more figurative, or objective, very figurative, right? where I think. Uh, I'm flexing a very similar muscle that I learned as an illustrator. Mm -hmm. right? You try to think of uh, ways to translate an, an, an idea in not a very obvious way, you know, in a way that has more dimensionality than simply describing what it is that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. it, it's not like that. It does. I remember a studio visit with the second year student last year in which we were talking about obviousness in art and how it's rarely a good thing but sometimes it is but you use the term non-obvious and then also multi-dimensional like it seems like in your work you're looking for non-obvious complex but 
deceptively simple, meaning on the surface, it, when you first look at it, it looks super simple, but there's, to me, there's this process of like distillation or something like that. Well, I guess that's where having a, a very strong emotion or idea to, to channel through um, helps create that complexity. But you don't hit the nail on the head, right? Like, you don't telegraph it. It's more like it's more on a sort of, but well, a less than obvious level. In, in a way, I'm I'm familiar with creating work that's accessible. Um, also because I work with things that are not specific to me only, but to a lot of people out there, especially. Yeah. So Jay, um, you um, you were like unlike Carlos and I think also Maria, you were you went straight from undergrad to grad from the BFA in a in an art school in Columbus to SVA, um, and maybe being in the big city and away from your hometown, maybe other things, maybe have your age. You started to experience a lot of personal growth and transformation during your two years here. Um, I guess this is how how did being in a period of dramatic personal transformation affect your work while you were here, and how was it to be in such an intense kind of almost like hot house art school environment while you're going through so much in your own life. Yeah. Um, I think growing up like as a trans person, not being able to be a trans person outwardly, like you learn how to compartmentalize a lot. So coming to New York, being like a loser kid from Ohio, like I was less worried about blending in or like impressing anyone and more just like embracing that I was a loser kid from Ohio. And I think people liked that charm. Um, I don't really like try to bullshit uh, being an artist in New York. And I think like the fact that I was going through such vulnerability and such intense shifts in my life personally, kind of like obviously showed it appeared in the work, but it also appeared in like the connections I was making with other people because like I was experiencing a lot of vulnerability and I feel like I kind of like comforted and welcomed vulnerability from other people. And so I got to have like really amazing conversations with people in my studio and and a lot of like my friends and my peers would like open up about like the deeper more personal parts of their practice that maybe they weren't like more as comfortable sharing so i think like what i got out of the program going through such an intense shift was a lot of people were just um kind of accepting uh the mirror that was me just clunk being clunky and uh <laughs> Now, looking back on those experiences, being a lot more confident and sure of like who I am and like where I was going then, I look back at that work and it's not that my work isn't personal now or that the work I will continue to make won't be personal, but I think that there was kind of like a adolescence to it that um, happens when you're a 26 year old transitioning so you're kind of like also 12 year old uh so yeah mm. i'm an adult going through puberty all over again and my work very much shows that <laughs> <laughs> um so carlos you um had relatively more professional experience as an artist when you arrived here mm. when you applied here I remember pretty vividly. Um, and like your practice was already quite well developed. You know, some people arrive here and their work changes radically or they really sort of find themselves as an artist. I feel like you had largely found your groove and 
I guess I'm wondering if there's some other students here. We always have a range of students with a range of levels of experience. There are other students here who are kind of in your shoes now. Any thoughts or advice for how to get the most out of a program like this when you're maybe a little further along in your artistic and professional development? Yeah, I mean, I think every every bit of input from my classmates and my uh, or rather from my peers and from the faculty was actually really helpful and important and kind of was you know I think what happened here was that I refined my work like there's no way it could have happened without this place like I quit my job I committed you know, two years of just being in my studio you know 40 50 60 hours a week sometimes um I had access to like a like the VFL which like gave me kind of you know the tools that I already knew how to use, but just like basically for free at most. Um, you made a huge installation in your studio inlaid for yeah, I made a freaking city floor for I made a wood floor for my studio across the street. Yeah, I brought over piece by piece. It was like I really just like you know installed myself in this place for lack of a better word. Um, and took advantage of it. I mean, I for me, it was like, I'm only going to do this once. Like, thank God. Um, but like, uh, yeah, it was it was really, like, I think, crucial to get to the, the work. You know, it was basically like, sure, in the amount of time it would have taken otherwise, or like, maybe you just change the trajectory in some ways. But like, I don't think the work would be anywhere near what it is now, which is like, um, what else can I say? Wonderful. No, like it's really like it's really like changed my work a lot and uh, for the better. I think. But yeah, it really was just committing and you know trying to be as present as possible and trying to be as open as possible too. I mean, I think there was moments where I was like, oh, like do I need to do this? Do I need to be here? Like, you know, my intro was a little cheeky, but like you know, there were moments where I was being challenged and where I was like having to come up with explanations for things that I wasn't having to have. Or, um, you know, even now when I work in my studio, it's like solitary. Like no one's asking me questions except myself. Like, you know, I'm the one that's walking in there being like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, do I have ideas? What are my ideas again? But like, it's really helpful when someone else is like, what are your ideas actually? Um, are you actually admitting that you occasionally doubt yourself? Because you seem so comfortable. No, like every day, like the train ride to the studio is an hour long. You know, that's like that's a long so hour. To die. <laughs> <laughs> that one hour a day. No, really. um, yeah, it's like, it, it's, it's true. Like the studio is a place of doubt. Mm -hmm. So, Maria, when you, you finished, you graduated from this place, and it was a strange time. And we, I imagine that you experienced some isolation and had a lot of time with your thoughts and your work no maybe not maybe you were with a lot of people in a giant bubble no 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 i was with a very energetic and loud partner uh, and our crazy cat that's more like a dog and um, so <laughs> that that kept me okay well but my i guess my question has to do with this theme of um radical or not so radical doubt that I have a feeling like most artists experience. And I was just imagining graduating into this pandemic void might have really given you an opportunity to, given those doubts, an opportunity to flourish. For sure. I think, especially um, having social media just like with you next to you. Right. In, in you see how fabulous other people's bubbles are? Yes. So you could be, oh, I'm going to post this. It's mm -hmm. great. And you post it. And someone does something similar. It's like, oh, we have more likes. It's better. But you go into that whole spiral. Um, so for sure, I was met with a lot of self doubt and, and yeah, ideas that did value in my, my esteem for the work. So how do so, you? work with or work through doubt to, and and find the courage to persevere 
and follow through and make stuff and share it with the world, especially mm -hmm. when, you know, for, well, for all of us, to some extent, you know, sharing it makes us vulnerable, yeah. even when the work isn't so personal. Well, I, I don't know. I think when that, that insecurity or doubt has been shifting very recently for me, actually, into a curiosity instead of doubting what place it could be. I just want to keep scratching at what it is that I've, that I've been trying to explore and just trust that, yeah, like my cat, moving in our furniture, but that, like trusting that if, if I believe it in it enough and it's complaining to me, then maybe someone else will find it that way. So I'm not as concerned with the perception of the work anymore, but more about honoring that that curiosity that I have for myself and the work that I'm doing. And that's that's how I stay more sane, making work. But no, doubt is not it's always gonna come looking back. I have to say I when I saw the work that you have in the Chelsea Gallery, I got to see the show the, the afternoon before it opened. First, I, I immediately recognized it as yours, even though it you know, wasn't part of the same series you were working on last time I'd seen your work. And it just really resonated for me. And I, so I think that intuition that if you find it compelling, others will find it compelling is a good one to listen to. Um, so Jay, how how um, have you been? Uh, I know that you've been really busy with transitioning, but um, what else have you been up to in this post MFA time? I mean, it's a bit of a leading question because I know part of the story. So tell right. us about what it's been like for you. Um, I mean, I'm not at all saying like I'm grateful there was like a global pandemic at all, but. The isolation was very necessary for me to get to this point because um, I don't know if like anybody experiences this in their own identities, but like in my experience, when you tell people you're trans, it's like no longer yours. And then you have to deal with like them interpreting your pronouns and your name and, all, and your body and like everything becomes other people's questioning. So to be able to get to sit for almost a year with it, um, kind of by myself, to myself, away from my family, um, it was, I think, necessary. It's probably the only reason that it happened when it did. Um, it was also hard to basically be making work about my family and then not be able to see them. It was like a weird shift to kind of have them be such a focus, especially my mother, and then to like have this like weird, invisible uh, barrier from her. Um, and then out of nowhere, uh, I got a text message from a friend of mine who was like, hey, uh, I know you're a big fan of Marilyn Minter. She's looking to hire someone. Um, so I went in to do an interview with her and she asked me what my sign was and then she hired me. Uh, Pisces, by the way. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, I've been working for her for about two years. Um, and it's been, it's been really nice because when I was here, I had a very specific idea of like what I wanted to do in the art world and what I thought success looked like and what I thought my career would be, especially like looking at her work and other artists like her kind of from a, a, afar. Um, and I've learned from working for two years that I actually do not want that life at all. And I could be like way further away from it and be happy um, because I, I get to kind of see firsthand all of the kind of mechanics that go into that. And um, it's definitely not something I saw in the bubble that was like grad school. And even though I was in New York and I was like meeting famous artists and they were coming into the program, I had no idea like what they had to do to get there. They were just kind of already there. Um, so kind of like peeking behind the curtain helped me understand that the kind of art worlds that I want to participate in doesn't look like that. Um, and that also just means that like, 
the work I make and the kind of speed in which I make it and the amount I'm pumping out like doesn't look as impressive as like maybe I'd hoped for, but um, I've been giving myself a lot of grace with that and transitioning and kind of going through all of the things that I've been going through, like radical acceptance has been like a huge part of my life now and just kind of accepting, navigating things like safety and time. Um, I, I feel like I have all this stuff to catch up on. So it made art seem like something that like I'll always have, but it wasn't the urgency that it had before. I also like came from gra undergrad to grad. So I've been making art in a vacuum for like six years straight um, with no break or moment of anything. So the fact that I haven't really made a lot in the last like year and a half, actually it's, it's been great. Um, it feels really nice to kind of like take a back seat and it gets me excited for like what I'm gonna make. And I think everything that I've been learning and experiencing through this kind of transition um, is going to like inform the work immensely. Working at Maryland's is gonna inform the work immensely. I've learned a lot about her painting style and how I can implement that to my own practice, what I wanna keep and leave. Um, wanting to deal with like dealers and galleries and um, it's definitely different like being in it versus like hearing about it or, or people talking about it and uh, like artist talks and studio visits. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been crazy. It's always weird to talk about uh, the last two years because it feels like a really long time for me. <laughs> uh, I feel like my concept of time is a little skewed. Um, yeah. So Carlos, how was your pandemic and how's it been now that things seem to be edging their way towards some kind of new normal? Um, oh, there's unprecedented times. I um, have been thriving kind of, which is strange. Um, I got Residency Unlimited and Abrams right out of school. Um, and that was just through like cold call of buying. Um, but I don't think like, I haven't been in New York for 10 years. I think almost every little relationship that I've had has been um, really lovely. And I've been trying to be, have tried to be patient for those 10 years and have been. And, um, I think things just start to blossom after a while, you know, like going back to this idea where like, I'll do almost any studio visit because it's just like, when I love studio visits, it helps me, you know, practice my, my language that, um, you know, we need to have for applying or that I need to have for applying and things. But it's also like, I don't know who's going to be on the jury for something. I don't know who's going to be looking at applications for all of these things that we're constantly applying to and getting rejected for. Um, you know, it really just takes the one person to argue for your work. And, you know, I know that now because I'm like on panels sometimes that are looking at applications. And um, it's really helpful to see someone's work there. Anyway. Um, so I got those two residencies, which were online as well, because it was mm -hmm. right after, you know, during the pandemic. So it was all studio visits online. So I got really good at Zoom studio visits, um, which are like such, so weird and uh, require just like a totally different skill set than people seeing your work in person because you're now pitching your a deck to someone, um, basically of your work, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's its own, its own kind of language and its own kind of presentation. But, um, yeah, I got a studio immediately through Chashima. You know, Chashima mm -hmm. is it's uh, the Durst's like real estate room filling yeah. <laughs> initiative that's run by Anita Durst. And I met someone. Um, the last show I did before the pandemic was Spring Break Art Show. Um, I met a painter there who worked for Chashima. And as soon as I needed a studio, she said, there's a nail salon that has an empty back room that we're trying to fill as an art studio. And so for six months, I worked in the back of a nail salon. That was really like <laughs> amazing and weird and smelly. And, um, but it was right down the street from my house. So like those pandemic days, I just walked to this weird studio and make collages. And um, so that was really helpful. And then from there, I was just, you know, started, uh, started getting into it. I was working some, but, um, I started selling work. I got picked up by a gallery. 
Uptown and I never saw anywhere. And I sort of just started stringing together like an artist's life. Um, you know, the residency is really helpful because they pay, they had stipends. Um, I started selling work. Then this year I started getting commissions, which um, I did Memorial Sloan Kettering Commission. I did a commission for LinkedIn, um, but it was at the Empire State Building. So that was pretty cool. And then um, I had a commission for Google. So all of those, I'm like in my sellout era. So all of those things are like um, like weaving together to make me like not have a job, which is like incredible. I taught at FIT for a semester, um, senior painting, advanced painting, which was really fun. And then I'll be teaching here in um, continuing ed starting this semester, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, it's really just like some months are better than others. <laughs> But my studio is, you know, it's funded and I can work. And, you know, sometimes I have to take weird jobs, but that's how it is. Mm -hmm. It keeps me in the studio like, pretty full time, which is great. Before I invite questions from our audience, um, do you guys have any questions for one another? Or is anything you want to, <laughs> want to say <laughs> that I might not have touched on? I mean, I think it's interesting because like you and I have like art assistant jobs and like for the most part you have like your studio practice is like your income. So I think that is like an interesting kind of like, you're all gonna be like a very mixed bag when you graduate as far as like how you make money and like how much time you have for your own practice. So I think the fact that like we can touch on that is like important to hear. Cause I know when I graduate as well, pandemic aside, it was like terrifying. I had no idea how I was going to make any money. And I definitely didn't want to like work retail or something. So um, getting an art job is weird because it, I, I made it sound really easy, but it's like, yeah, there's a lot of just like throwing things at the wall and hoping something sticks. Um, but it, for jobs. Yeah, yeah. Applying for lots of jobs and hoping that something pans out. Yeah, but honestly, the, the best way to like get a job is to like be a good person to people and like make people feel um like you're paying attention when they're talking and like you're fun to be around um honestly like that's the best advice i could give anybody it's just like be cool that's easier for you than for some of us but um <laughs> How's your job? I didn't really know much about what tell me to tell us about your day job um, or evening job or whatever it So happens. at the moment I work for two separate artists. Um which um that one of the artists I've worked for like six years now, um on and off because of immigration stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> and the other one came. It's a recent job that I got through a recommendation from faculty here. So, yeah, like Jay said, be nice <laughs> and show up. Um, but that's been great. Last year was super, super busy. Um, it's one of these artists was doing a lot of shows, so I didn't have a lot of time to myself and to focus on my own work. But this year, I've decided that when I block out at least one week, one day of the week, for my art practice, um, because I burn out and mm -hmm. it's yeah. sad if I don't make my own art. But uh, no, I've been incredibly fortunate. That's nice. yeah, you have to be nice and lucky and have your materials maybe lined up, websites, CDs, all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, all that practical stuff I wish I'd asked even more about while I was here. Yeah. So <laughs> never, never did that. Just like how to do any of it. Like yeah. I don't think any of us were we were all just so like, I have to make this amazing thing I'm focusing on and I won't sleep or eat or do to do that. But then like when it came to like how to get a job. Um maybe that's a new workshop. What to apply to, where to apply, like knife isn't the only place to apply to. Sometimes it's like black hole. Or how do you contact? acquaintance how do you how do you 
re enter these relationships or Mm -hmm. not seeing everybody show. as a contact but also just like seeing people yeah. as like friends and people that you are like excited to work with I have yeah. every like other artist that I like and not just buddies with but like had to meet through um emailing them or like reaching out to them were like way more established than I was and it was just as simple as like, like I'm a huge fan of your work and would love to work with you in some capacity and a lot of the times like that's very flattering and exciting and hopefully if you do it right um you'll gain like a really nice kind of mentorship or friendship with an artist that you were really into mm -hmm. and not one that was brought to you but one that you sought out yourself there's kind of a pride in that um and i'm friends with artists in a way that i never thought i would be because there were artists that i was like obsessed with back in Ohio that I never thought in a million years I would meet. Um, and now I'm like working with and like their names next to mine. And like, that's so exciting and really cool. So that is great advice. Don't think about networking. Think, think about friending. Yeah. Not friending in the Facebook sense, but making friends. Just okay. Reciprocal relationships. I feel like. Yeah, yeah. sure. Reciprocal mutual. And just where, you know, Relationships that have integrity where you're hanging out or spending time together because you genuinely like and admire one another. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. People can the way anything works. Mutual exploitation leaves everybody feeling exploited. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I also think that um, something you suggested when if you when looking for jobs, you can look and see jobs that are listed and advertised, but you can also think about where you'd like to work or for whom you would like to work and reach out to them and let them know. Yeah. Um, rather than, you know, like if you would really just love, love, love to work at Smack Mellon, go, you know, go to Smack Mellon and express that interest. Yeah. Um, Use your SBA email, institutional <laughs> email. And I'm serious, it's a tool. Yeah. Like, um, mm -hmm. Your dot edu email, like you can cold call almost anyone with that. Like it's yeah. better than a damn Gmail email account. I'll tell you Less that. likely to get into spam folder. Yeah, yeah, it's just like the cold call with the edu is like for real. It's, you realize it's another benefit of the degree. Just the institutional <laughs> adjacency. Yeah, I mean, like when I was here, I would just like invite people to the studio because mm -hmm. you're in freaking you're on Twenty First Street in Manhattan. You'll never have a studio here again. Trust me. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so expensive. Yeah, yeah. Freaking Broadway Junction, babe. Like, but I have a storefront, so that's chill. I have a backyard, but it's like far. It's way at the end of the AC. Yeah. yeah. But it's expressed, so it's not that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. East New York. It's like where Brownsville, yeah, Crown Heights merge. Merge. Yeah. So it's actually more like Brownsville, Crown Heights. Because I'm on uh, the other side of Broadway Junction. And your mentors and like, if if you have a good relationship with any of the faculty or mentors here, like their net is much larger than yours, and yeah. that can be something. Tell them you need a job. Yeah, sure. I had a really weird circle, full circle moment with a mentor of mine because she just recently uh, posed for Marilyn Mentor, and she asked me to like work on the photo shoot with her as like her personal fluffer. <laughs> um so i got to like oil up her naked body and it was just really oh, yeah it was really in intense and i just kind of like hey <laughs> so cool wow. um yeah so like weird full I circle yes <laughs> all right um shall we uh entertain some questions from students what do you guys want to ask what do you want to know Thank you. Instagram um, presentations. Um, I have a question for Maria. Um, I remember your exact words more like about your practice. Um, you said you like to repurpose your clay. Like you use your own, like break down your old works. Yes. So I use oil based clay, meaning it'll never dry. It'll never harden. It's just it'll be perpetually uh, pliable and malleable. Um, I mean, I imagine if it, does, if it is really, really old, old, then you can add baby oil to it and re-energize it. But 
sulfur, sulfur free oil based clay is it's really good for making molds, rubber molds. So that's that's what I use. So I've been kind of using the same like eight pounds of clay for yeah, all of these other works. That's awesome. <laughs> Sustainable. Yeah. Very sustainable. <laughs> should, should lead every artist to know what that is. It's really cool. I've been um, using the same eight pounds of clay. Like, that's like an amazing like, way, 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 way to start any that. artist talk. Like, just break that yeah, shit down. Okay. How about a question from the back row? Look, who's in the back row has a question? It is not a bad kid. Back row, Tian, you're looking for a job, right? Don't you have a question? Let's see, Ilya. Anybody questions in the back row? Chan? No? Isho, you got a question? No? All right. Second to the last row. Camila, you have a question, don't you? No? All right. Third row, any questions? You guys are just going to shrink. Bring them on. Here we go. Uh, like, No, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, definitely. Try for that. <laughs> I don't know if it's like a moment as much as it's like moments. Like there's multiple times where you're like, oh shit, I, I did a thing. And that's kind of exciting. Or like people notice something you did that you thought no one would ever notice. Yeah, those those like strong moments happen a lot. Use those deadlines. That was great for me. Just to have a deadline to have to finish something really grid or a meeting. I would use everything as a deadline just to try and finish a work, have a complete work. It's really like it's a discipline to finish stuff, man. And like to be able to have like a purpose for it, you won't have that again. Like you'll be in your studio purposeless for a, like even now I'm busy and there's moments where I'm just like, well. Ah, what am I going to do? Go in to my studio to do <laughs> right. Even though, like, I know the grand scheme things I need to, but it's like, yeah, use those those moments to, like, right. so just it. show it to some people, give it a title, take a picture of it. Absolutely. All that stuff. Yeah. Or kind of. How important or not important has, like, social media been for you guys? Because I personally am very opposed to that, and it seems very integral, and you can't really exist without it. I feel like it's changing. Like now, like the algorithm on Instagram is so messed up. It's just kind of like, what are you gonna do? Like take out an ad. Um, <laughs> it seems like really difficult to get beyond that. All now. put a pop song in a video of your art yeah i mean now you like i guess you can make a video but like for me i'm going to be honest with you it's been invaluable like but i'm also like a performer so like my instagram is also like started off as like a place for me to like be a, a character like, not like an actual character but i was like took it you know kind of seriously because i've had it i'm old i've had it for a while so like part of my personality is kind of on there so i guess like people look at it whatever like you know i'm quote unquote good at it people say but i don't think you need it per se i think it's like what's more important is to have some sort of something that is it delegate was like you should control what comes up on google when people search your name oh that's a good one yeah it's like if you have hours. anything online like um, controlling like the SEO search on your name can be really important because then like the first thing that comes up is like the images that you want people to see right so like say you apply to Averts Art Center, Sharp Valentis, like Smack Melon, anything like if you get beyond a certain point they're going to start googling you which is like terrifying to know but it's real like they're going to type your name into google and see what comes up and if it's like like there's like I have a mugshot from like you know, 2001 on there. It's just like, I don't want that on the top of the SEO. I want to like very, <laughs> that could help though. But some like, maybe like some, yeah, some yeah. like bad bullshit. You don't want that like old MySpace page that has your like scene kit. Like you don't want that. Yeah, I don't know. You're Google as a chill. You don't really think for that, but. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's just like, some, like I think that's somewhat more important. Um, 
Yeah. I did get this solo show though through Instagram. Yeah, I mean, I, mean like, I know it sucks. My my thing about Instagram is like, like <laughs> it's a little less about like hoping that it'll get you opportunities as much as like using it as another way to like showcase people who are interested in your work, like other facets of you. Like I had a, a professor once here say that like having separate Instagrams is like a big no-no because that's what your website is for. So people go to your Instagram because they're like, okay, who's the artist behind all this work I'm seeing? Like, what do they do? What does their day-to-day look like? You know, do they have family? Like how are, how are the things that they're interested in? Like, pumping into what they make Mm -hmm. and some people are really interested in that like it's not always like trying to separate the art from the artist Some people really like care about the artists themselves as well as a person um so that's how I've always thought of Instagram it's like I have had people who get opportunities that like were friends with me on Instagram give them to me less random strangers DMing me Mm -hmm. I think for me it's become essentially just to have it because often at openings or galleries, I mean, I don't know, I think I've handed out two business cards and okay. I'm sorry yeah. that. So just giving your hand always mm-hmm. a good way for people to connect you. But lately, yeah. my relationship to social media has been more like it being more true to what would I, how generous am I feeling? And then let that dictate how mm-hmm. I use social media. Like, I think for a while we were very frustrated. You need to do this, you need to do that, you need to post three times a day, or you no, know, like, what would you do like, in other circumstances? Like, like it doesn't really have, have to be so broad or calculated. Make it a reflection of how you would behave. If, if, if it doesn't make sense, that's a little vague. Is the first thing to be real? I don't know. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> it's the worst like, No. <laughs> Sorry, but obviously I'm just sick. <laughs> yeah, I'm so over social media, but just won't die. <laughs> no. All right. Um, one last question. Dina. Hi. Uh, Hi. Hello. Hi. Good to you. I know them just through my first year. And um, you know, I always saw you. Go far, and I just I mean, it's amazing that you followed just one of my favorite um, artists. Right. And um, your word is good, by the way. Best pieces project that I've seen. I just thought, and yeah, I'm mean, never really able to talk to you, but I was love to work from far. And um, thank you. It's still there to do your thing, but it's not the point that I um, wanted to ask you, like, do you guys remember or any have any suggestions for? Second year students who are consider this is like the last semester. What have you done or, or, or uh, things that you would suggest as to prepare to so that would ease up the gap between mm-hmm. the, like the, the school life and the reality, you know, and so it has a better connection. Um, mm-hmm. Doesn't matter if it's in terms of terms of jobs or like just transitioning or becoming like your own boss, you know, like just having like a more disciplined um our practices. Yeah. So just like any type of suggestion. I mean it seems like you have been making a lot of work just from what I can see. Correct. I think the most important thing I learned here was the discipline of an actual studio practice. Like what it means to be in your studio working um how that actually functions like just you know this this is pretty loose here even though we do have like visits and deadlines it's like you it's up to you to be able to get into the studio and make your work um that's a gift like so much of being an artist is actually just like i said finishing your work but yeah carrying that practice like and continuing it however you can i mean like when I was I was making like collages in the back of that nail shop. It's because my studio was like this it was like a closet. It's like the only space I could do, and I couldn't do that at home. Yeah. So yeah, it's just like those little things that you can take with you. Like you can't take like the VFL. You can't take like you know your physical studio, but you can take like the discipline that you have for your work out of here. You can also take like the people that you connected with. I mean, like you know, I connected with like James Sienna. Um, 
uh, Camille Janan Rashid, who I just like built a table for her studio for. Um, you know, those people that I really had deep connections with that um, those connections are real. Like, you know, obviously they're getting paid to be here, but um, those things are like your first professional contacts kind of in New York. And so like, you know, with respect, you can carry those relationships out of here too, which is nice. And not to like broken record it, but like friends, community, like, I, like all of our situations are different. Some some of you are not gonna be able to like afford a studio or some of you are not going to maybe like want to get a studio right away or whatever your experiences are. Some of you are gonna like feel so burnt out and like not wanna touch your art for a sec too. Like I think friends help ground you. They help give you support. They also are in the same boat as you are if your friends are art friends and so I was very fortunate that like I made like a weird pack of friends here that I just like have just kept hanging out with and now we're like a weird group of people and um it's nice because they're all in the same boat as I am like we all graduated from here we all got kind of like plopped into the world and we're all just trying to like navigate it we all have day jobs and like trying to have studio practices and making work with them and showing. And it, it's been kind of nice to have people just showing you support. And um, it takes the pressure off and you actually see the real behind it because a lot of social media and all the other things, like the art world is a lot of show. And I think that's probably the biggest thing I learned coming out of this space is like, go through this, program like knowing what it is and just like it, radically accepting that that's what it is it's like a bubble it's a vacuum and it's that's not necessarily a bad thing it's just like that's what you have to see it as it's like this group of people together in this space doing this thing is like this is going to happen now and never again and so like accepting and appreciating it for what it is and then when you get out of there kind of like allowing you to radically accept what you're entering and not kind of being stuck on the constraints of this space like you don't have a studio so you can't make your art it's not helpful because then you like will feel stuck and never make again um so be grateful for your studio but also don't let it be like the catalyst for why you make mm -hmm. be grateful for your mentors but don't let them be the catalyst for like why you're making these deadlines happen like do it because you want to like show up and be present and be good yeah thank you, thank you.